How is that better now? Okay. Herman. I, I tell you, it was, uh, the last two days was, was a lot of fun and getting to know uh, Herman and, and Bill and Clayton and I already knew Sammy very well and Gerald and uh, Matt uh, and uh, Kevin and then, yeah, and uh, Phil and Don. Trying, there's a couple of people that aren't here. Uh, but anyway, uh, and Rory, of course. Well, I had to keep my thumb on Rory, and, and I do have classroom teaching experience and school principal experience. I had to just keep, sta- I had to use my proximity, and I had to just keep right by him, or he'd be wandering off somewhere. Uh, but no, every, everybody was extremely nice, and y'all are so hospitable, and uh, like Rory was saying, it, it is, it's definitely an a incredible family uh, of wood turning groups incredibly uh, selfless and you just want to share and everybody is, is just honored to say hey how'd you do that come on let me show you no big deal I don't have any secrets uh, I'm just always I was telling Sammy I'm whatever I do I, I'm able to do because I'm just stubborn enough to to keep persisting till I get it done and so that's that's sort of a couple of ideas here I, I love wood turning I love embellishing and uh, Just all of uh, the ones that were able to come to the class last two days just did a fantastic job. It was, I learned just as much maybe as, if not more, what y'all learned. So this, Sammy said, hey, would you, Sammy invited me, so if it's good, great. If it's bad, you talk to him about it. But um, there's this idea I came up with and I ended up calling them flowering vases. And it came about because of uh, a friend of mine. Actually, it was a former student from when I first started teaching. We reconnected, and he was building a house. And uh, he, had, he had cleared out some red cedar trees. And he said, hey, Corey, I want you to come over, and I want you to take some of what I cleared out and make something for us for our house. You know, great way to, great emotional meaning story behind it. And he had cleared out a bunch of red cedar trees, and, and I was looking at them. He had them off in, the, in a big old pile, and I was like, what the heck am I, am I going to make out of a red cedar tree? Or, and these were not big red cedar trees. They were uh, about this size. And so I said, well, um, you know, he had more faith in me than I. I was like, okay, yeah, I'll make something. And so I, I ended up cutting off, um, you know, about a foot up with my chainsaw. And I, and I had this, this uh, part of the, the whoop, I'll stay here, sorry, red cedar tree. And, and I just was looking at it and I was thinking, what the heck can I do with that? And I was looking at it, looking at it, and then I was, it just dawned on me if I turn it upside down, it, it sort of looked like a bouquet of flowers. And, and it had a lot of organic kind of petal-like, flower-like features. And so then I said, well, well, maybe I can make it into sort of like a vase and, you know, turn it and, and have some nice curves here and and turn it, uh, you know, use uh, Forstner bits and other turning and, you know, make it like a vase. And then I said, well, what the heck do I do with all these branches? First of all, I learned very quickly when this is turning on the lathe, you have to be careful because it's hard to see all these things spinning around. And uh, I'm not the, the sharpest knife in the drawer, and I had to keep being reminded, don't stick your hand through here. So I got my knuckles slapped many, many times, still do. But um, it, I just came up with this idea of a flowering vase. And I was all excited. I was thinking, man, I came up with an original idea. And we all know it's hard to come up with an original idea. And I, I, I said, well, let me just search and see if there's anything out there like this. And I searched and searched. And lo and behold, I found that uh, in the early 2000s, and this is in my handout, uh, referencing, there's a guy by the name of Gary Stevens from California. 
And he, uh, and I do highly encourage you to, to check this out. He uh, lives out in the Redwood Forest area, and he would, he would find redwood burls at the stump area and uh, stump parts of the trees and all kinds of stuff. And this is what he did. Uh, he worked on a huge scale. But, and he called these emerging flowers. And so when I saw he did this, I was like, dang it, I didn't have an original idea <laughs> after all. But it really doesn't matter. I, I don't... Uh, on, okay. This is... This article... I know we're getting a lot of brightness issue, but this article... Here we go. This article is in the reference page of the handout that's on your website, Gary Stevens. And it, it's just, when I looked, and there's some great videos in there too, but it just made me realize, well, awesome. I'm, I'm going to do my version of that. And, uh, and so I, I started developing that. And this was, I don't know, four years ago, three years ago. And uh, I, I started thinking about, well, where do I get blanks for this? So, of course, red cedar and other trees that uh, I would cut off at the ground level because they had a lot of flaring out. Um, and I found a, a number of these here. Uh, can I walk over here? All right. Uh, this actually is from a uh, orange tree stump where it was flaring out. This is from a... a uh, do, 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 do. American elm tree that was flaring out. That's from a cedar elm tree. This is from a, from a small, oh yeah, honey locust tree. Uh, that's from a red cedar tree. And that's from a crotch of a Bradford pear tree that had ant infestation and had all these holes. And so I said, well, I'm going to accentuate, accentuate that that and I used my wood burner and said I'm going to really make those stand out because I thought that was cool. Um, what so how to, oh, and then these right here these are all basically crotch pieces, you know stuff that you'd probably throw away firewood whatever. But this is a triple crotch. When I see stuff like this, I'm I'm thinking, wow, I could make a flowering vase out of that. I could and I will. Um, this one I don't know that I'll do. It's a little small, but still. It has a lot of what I'm looking for. Um, I'm looking for something that has a lot of uh, spreading out and has a, a good part of the limb there. Here's another one that I'm going to turn into a flowering vase at some point. Um, great question. I'm looking for something that it l ideally has at least three, three limbs and ideally spread out in a circular fashion and not too flat. Uh, some, there's a, you f we find a lot of crotches that are just a two crotch and sort of flat. I've tried to make some of those and eh, it's all right. But uh, something that has at least a triple crotch or some unique, um, like even this right here is a, a triple crotch, but it's got this sort of limb going off this way. And, and, there, and I find it even, as I've done more of these, I find it even more interesting if they're at different levels uh, to create. Um, initially, I was doing everything sort of flat. And as I did more and more of these, I, I found them to be even more visually pleasing if they were at multiple levels. So thank you for asking that question. Um, so how the heck do I explain this? Um, it's, it's, uh, I did demo this at SWAT a few years ago. <coughs> and... Um, I didn't want to make a whole lot of, <coughs> excuse me, a whole lot of noise or a lot of mess with sanding, but uh, Sammy said it's okay, and so it, this is going to be messy, and I'll show you all the tools that I use, but it does involve turning. Rory said I'm gonna t that I'm going to turn a, a flowering vase. I'm not real. I mean, I'm going to turn part of it, but there's no way you can turn that. 
because it, of the nature of it. But um, I'm going to show you in three, three phases. This right here is like what it looks at like at the beginning. And several have asked, well, how did you make a tenon on that? I'll tell you. And then I'm going to take this off after I show just a few things that go through my head and how I start the initial shaping. And this one I prepared sort of midway where I've already uh, hollowed it out there and I've already done some shaping. And when I get to this point, I do a lot of sculpting. And I'll show you that and all the different tools I use. And then this one here... Um, this this one's interesting. It is, if you look at it, it is sort of flat, but it had a lot of interesting flaring out. And so this one is, I'm not even sure what wood this is. Uh, elm, maybe. I should have made a note of that. But I'll show you what I do on some of the finer uh, sculpting and shaping and some of the final things that I go into thinking about as I'm making it more organic looking, flower-like. So it's, it's going to be sort of three steps. Um, when I get to that third step, I'm going to have to take a quick break and set up some stuff here to be able to do that. Um, let's see. What, oh, how did I create a tenon on this? Very, very carefully. Um, and you can see, you know, Herman's thinking, I don't know if that's safe. <laughs> you know? Well, it, it's going to work. And uh, if it comes off, it won't hit probably too far back there, so don't worry about it. No, it, it, it's going to be all right. But the way I did create a tenon is, and I've done this num numerous times, what I, I did, I would typically use my chuck, and I would sometimes carve out an, an edge in here so that I could use my chuck often, or I've got a bigger chuck too, and expand the jaws to basically sort of like you would make a mortise and expand the jaws in there. So it's just sort of a, a, a get by way to mount it like this. And my lathe, I've got a Laguna and the headstock slants backwards. So depending on how the limbs are, I'm able to actually get by with this. Um, and, it, and I won't have to trim stuff so it doesn't hit the headstock. And then once I do that, I get my tail stock up and I'll uh, figure out the best orientation of it and I'll wiggle it around till I find exactly how I'm going to want it to be. All right. And then I make a tenon on it and I flip it around, of course, and then use my chuck. And initially, I do something, I'll rig up something like this just because uh, when this is not balanced at all, and when I turn this on, several of y'all may say, I'm going to move to the back. <laughs> I'm not going to turn it fast, of course. I'm, I was, I'm smarter now than I was when I first started, uh, as we all are. But uh, I'm going to, this, of course, is for safety. This needs to stay on here and not fly off. And I'll be using a, a slow speed at the beginning here as, as well which is certainly smart and I am a uh, big proponent of wearing face shields uh, especially cannot emphasize that en enough especially when you're starting out with an unbalanced piece you got you cannot cannot rev that speed up too fast and you have to really be sure you wear a face shield if you've ever had a piece come apart on the lathe I have um, and half of it I had my face shield on and half of it I had it actually mounted to an old face plate half of it was a piece of mesquite um, and it hit the side glancing blow to my face shield here and had I not had this on um, it I'm sure it would have crushed you know the side of my skull there cheekbone and everything so cannot emphasize safety enough so be sure that you do follow safety protocols there All right so I'm going to I'm going to see how fast <laughs> I can turn this safely. And, if, and I, I mean that with all seriousness. You know, it's, it's going to be wobbling around. And all I'm going to be doing at the beginning, and this is not rocket science, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. You know, you know that's, <laughs> that's 300, 380 RPM right there, which is not very fast. And uh, 
and I've just got a, a you know, 5 8 inch bowl gouge. I also have a, a, a big uh, spindle gouge here, but um, the whole point is I'm going to just work on creating the beginning, the beginning of a nice gentle curve, a, a nice gentle concave curve flowing up. That's what I'm initially looking at doing. So I'm at 379. Can y'all still hear me okay? Okay. All right. Oh, and you have an overhead camera there. All right. So, um, of course, when you're starting out, you have an unbalanced piece. You have to obviously go at a real slow pace and don't take big bites or it's, you're going to get a <laughs> something's going to happen and it's not pleasant. You don't want that to happen. So uh, I'm just sort of taking little bites, no big deal. I'll, once I get this going a little bit better, I'll uh, get my roughing gouge out. And I'll be the first to say, wow, that's real exciting, Corey. You know, it's not exciting at all. Uh, and as, as you get more and more turning experience, you become a little, you become somewhat uh, ambidextrous. I'm right-handed, but there's situations where I definitely want to turn left-handed. And I know Sammy's back there going, I hope he's not going to spend an hour doing this right here. I'm not, Sammy. And his lovely wife, Maureen, came. And it's because I gave her a hard time. Rick Cannon's a good friend of, our, of mine as well. And I found out, well, Maureen, I don't think she was planning on coming this morning. And, and I found out that when Rick Cannon came and did a demo, she came and saw his demo and I said, really? You're not planning on coming and seeing my demo? That Well, and so I, I, I guilted her into coming. So thank you for coming. That looks pretty good. It, it is. Uh, hey, great comment, uh, John, right? Yeah. It, so, um, it, and so you, you're asking about the dryness of the wood. And often, you know, uh, someone will ask me, do you, do you uh, are you looking for dry wood, wet wood? Well, um, typically, uh, I've found that I get the best results. Like when I go and find and harvest some some blanks, I will you know heavily coat heavily coat the uh, end grain, and I'll keep watching. I'll set it aside because I really uh, want want to avoid cracking issues. Um, but I'll show you in the next piece I have how, when that I like to turn. Sometimes I like to get the most gnarly piece that some people would say, oh, that's trash. Uh, but there are some situations when some cracking can be used as advantages when what you're going to be producing has a lot of uh, elements flaring out and I'll show you that in the next piece. This is pretty dry and I, I'm really I, it may be Bradford pear I'm not sure but uh, first thing like what you're seeing which is not exciting at all but uh, what I'm gonna what I would continue to spend time doing is getting this further down and start creating the whole objective is to start creating a nice flare outward that's that's the whole point um, and I I may when I'm going through the turning process uh, I'm not going to work my way too far too far up here it just sort of depends on the every piece is a little bit different and uh, somewhere from a turning standpoint I'm just finding the the center mass that is in common circularly okay so you know, I, I'm going to spend just a, maybe three or four more minutes. Sammy's. Oh, yeah.
Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, uh, this is just a, a quick fix. Um, great, thank you uh, for asking. This is definitely rigged just for this particular shape here um, because, again, it's for safety reasons. This is a very unbalanced piece, and if I was trying, if I was foolishly just trying to do what I'm doing just with the hold of the chuck, that'd be really stupid, quite honestly. Um, and so I always bring the tailstock up, and depending on where I want to orient it, I may or may not have a really good way to provide appropriate safe pressure. And so I was using some foam here, and, and I was like, nah, it's not working. Then Gerald said, hey, here's something, and he got this out of some box back there, and I, I said, hey, yeah, I'll make that work. Um, but it is very, very important when you have an unbalanced piece like you do here, uh, don't go too fast and make sure you do have your tail stock up for safety. Thank you for Thank you. sure. Any other quick questions? All right. So back to the exciting turning part, and it will get more exciting. So I, you know, I, I would just keep plugging away trying to safely find what will end up being the, the curve that is going to start flaring upward and outward. And when I'm doing this also, I'm thinking about, quite honestly, even at this early point, I'm also thinking about the overall shape of the vessel. Um, I, I've done different foots, uh, the, I've done different bottoms different times, um, and the one that's on that, the, the one closest to me that's on that black block there, uh, I really, that's, you know, I, I call it a flowering vase. Uh, you want to hold that up, Sammy? Don't, don't break it. Don't drop it. Pardon? No, ma'am. There's no, I don't want you touching any, anything I've done. <laughs> Ouch. The, this piece here, it, yeah, it actually uh, doesn't really have a, a base. Uh, it's carefully bounced there, but I have some museum wax that's keeping it there. And you might even say, well, I, I don't know if that's really a flowering vase, per se. And it, it's more of a flowering bowl, probably. Uh, well, hang on, keep it level, Sammy. You got it. Uh, uh, yeah, all right. But anyway, um, I, I, so when I have something that I'm still calling it loosely a flowering vase, so it's a flowering vessel, um, but they can come in all kinds of shapes. But the original idea was more of a, a vase-like, sort of taking the idea of a wood-turned vase and a bouquet of flowers or some, uh, like a daylily or a trumpet vine flower. Anyway. So enough, enough on this right here. I'm not going to take more of your time to say, wow, that was so good. Did you see Corey just turning that spindle, turning? That was exciting. No, so I'm not going to do any more of that, but I am going to uh, move on to the, sort of the big second phase because this is not all that exciting. This gets a little more into, you know, how I do what I do on it, and that's what you're I would imagine I would be more interested in. So this is where I get into specialized tools and, and things that I'm thinking about. So let me take these out and let me grab my chuck key here, take this out. You know, I, in doing, I've done this demo just a few times, not all that many times, but uh, I'll set this aside and even some of these over here were I've used in a demo process and I end up finishing them up later. So that's, that's all this was. So now we have this piece here and I'm actually at this point not going to do any more turning. What I'm going to use is a, a great tool, a great resource that Trent Bosch has come up with. 
and it's used for uh, sculpting and carving. And that is uh, this, oh, I, dadgummit, I should have, uh, I'll, I'll take my check off in a second, I forgot. But this right here is a, what does he call this, sculpting, uh, carving vice, there we go. I, they're pretty expensive, and I, I even tried to make my own, and I, because I'm, I'm real frugal, I hate spending money, but, uh, and I made one, I'm not, I didn't even bring it, it didn't work all that great, and it didn't move things around like I needed it to move around, so uh, I finally ponied up the money at SWAT last year, and I bought, bought one, and I've just now started using it, and it's, it is great. I wished I really needed to have uh, started using it before because it allows me to have something in the chuck and move it around all kinds of ways while I use all kinds of power tools to continue the sculpting that I'm doing. Uh, and honestly, I, even when I get to this point, uh, I'm, this is red cedar here. And uh, you, do, 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 do. Yeah, there we go. It's hard to see with the glare of the light, but there's, uh, you can see down in there and you can see the beautiful red cedar part. And uh, I've, I've done a number of these out of red cedar because that's what I first started with. And it really, if you look at the, the handout that's on y'all's website, you'll see a number of pictures where you have the outside of that, the, the sapwood, the, the light colored sapwood of the red cedar tree. And then as it goes up, you'll have this beautiful coloration of the red cedar, and then it flares out, and, and it just creates a great contrast, the interplay between that, the heartwood and the sapwood in the red cedar. Red cedar cracks awfully easy, and uh, you have to be careful with that. All right, let me get this chuck off here. Check on here. Get this in here. Like I say, this has been this this tool here is a game changer. Uh, I have worked on these many different ways, everything from holding them in my lap to working on them uh, on the lathe and and locking the 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 spindle and trying to move around and it the best overall way that I've been able to work on them has ended up being using this tool here. So, let me pull this out. Lock that down. There we go. So I can, it gives me the ability to move this around every way I need to. And it, you know, I guess the bad thing it is, if it is a bad thing, I know this is going to interfere with the camera. We may have to move this some. I'm not sure. But uh, it, it does have it way up high. Yes? Uh, oh, okay. So if you need... Uh, Rory? <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, this right here, there's a crack right here. I don't know if you can see it, but there's a crack right here that goes from here to here. And here's an example how you've got a imperfection and it, it, it would cause many people to say, ah, it's got a big old crack in it, I can't use it. Well, when I see that, when I'm thinking about a flowering vase, I said, awesome, I already have a natural break in the, the line there, I'm gonna use that to my advantage and that's gonna be separation of some elements uh, or some petals. So I, it's no big deal to me when I see that. Um, hey, Clark. Yes. Maybe you addressed this earlier. When we were done carving, done doing the raw shaping, uh -huh. how much movement, healing back are you going to have of that as it dries further? Typically, by the time I'm working on it, it's, it's pretty well dried out enough and there's not going to be much movement. Yeah. I, in, in this most cases I really need it I'll watch it carefully as it's drying and I'll keep putting can you hear me now 
Okay, sorry. Thank you, Gerald. Uh, the, quest the question is how much movement uh, might happen as I'm going through this process. Again, I really don't like to do this process with green wood because I'd rather have it already dried out enough where I'm going to expect little or no movement at that point. But, uh, and this is fairly dry. I've got a moisture meter, but I didn't uh, uh, do any more uh, readings on it. But when I get it to this point, after I've done, I've created what I think is gonna be the, the, the basic curve flowing out, then what I'm gonna do is, that's when I, I, I start pulling power tools. This is a angle grinder, and this is a, a carbide tipped wheel and this makes a lot of noise and makes uh, a lot of mess but it does a great job for removing material i have uh, these these wheels are not cheap uh, i think these are made by cutsaw um, this is more of a this is more of a rounded wheel and y'all can pass this one around i'm probably not going to use that sandra let me give you that but that's um, it, it does a great job removing wood, and as you might imagine, if it does a great job of removing wood, it will remo remove skin too, so you have to be real careful. Um, I, I uh, typically use uh, hearing protection when I'm doing this, obviously, and eye protection. So I'm going to pull this out and just show you some examples of what I typically am looking at. I'm, I'm looking at the flaring here, the, I'm looking at the flaring out, and so I am looking at shaping that further. So I'm, I'm looking at further taking this, this, this curve, this arc, and I'm carefully imagine. I have to visualize doing so much this way, uh, but I, I can overdo because I've learned you can overdo it and then set yourself up issues when you start trying to complement the inside carving to. Um, work with the outside carving but I, I do quite a bit here and I'll use I will use this angle grinder I'll also use another grinder with um, sanding flaps attachment on it that is showing not to be tightened up enough why is that not I don't have a shop, when, but <laughs> well, hang on a sec, hey, just a second. Oh, well, that's not plugged in, but hang on. Uh, I do this right now. I'm working out of my garage because we're about to build a shop, um, and that. I've been saying that for the last six, eight months, but uh, about to, about to, about to, but it's finally gonna start happening. And maybe, give me just a second. For some reason, this is not tightening down. Maybe I had it reversed. Thank you. It, it could, it could. Yes, sir. All right, thank you. It, uh, right now I'm working in the garage, and I, when I do this, I, I have a lot of fans blowing out as best, best as I can, and it makes a big mess. Uh, when I do end up having this in my shop, I'll have to just sort of gauge whether or not I can create enough dust 
collection that makes it worth it, or maybe I just need to open, I'm going to have a big roll-up door, and I may end up uh, just rolling my lathe out, or this, this tool actually can be mounted onto a, a, a work table, too. So I'm going to, we'll have to see. It does make a lot of mess, so is that what you're asking about? Okay. Okay. Okay, test. All right. Another tool that I use besides the uh, carbide tip wheels is I'll spend a lot of time using uh, power sanding as well. This is a 120 grit. I probably won't do a lot here, but uh, let me see if I can turn and put this down here to show some light better. Now, if you're sitting over here, you have a much better seat without any camera, but now you've got the camera working good. All right, so I spend a lot of time working on this end, and one of the great tools I have, this is a one-inch uh, saber-tooth carbide ball burr, and uh, they're expensive, but they last pretty well. And so I'll, I'm going to show you what I do a lot with, can you go to the end? Uh, in stock, uh, tail stock camera, very good. So I'll spend a lot of time, I'll spend a lot of time working You want to hold that down? There you go. You have a purpose now. <laughs> All right. All right. So I'll spend a lot of time going in here with this ball there, with this guy around it. Because I want to start developing channels. I want to start developing natural channels that are coming from the inside and flaring out on the inside to complement to end up complimenting, you're doing great, I'm going to say right where you are. Uh, to come. He said stay there. Oh, oh. yeah, stay right here a second. No, you're fine, you're fine. Okay, just keep that right there. All right, because I want to start creating these inner channels here so they'll complement the outside. So you want to take that, it, it'll make more sense when you see this sort of in the works. Pass that around. So I'm going to spend a lot of time right here. Okay, you might say, wow, Corey, it looks like this takes a long time. The answer is, yeah, it does. And people will ask me, wait a for one second, I'm going to rotate it again. Go ahead, let's find that box there. Yeah, I'm trying to get it. So. They don't have it, two pictures in your row. Well, what, yeah, I've got this here that keeps hitting the... Oh, you grind it off, huh? I know, yeah. I was trying not to grind it off, but I... Uh, yeah, but I uh, yeah, I'm going to grind it off real quick. Let me go ahead and hold it there. I just shortened that. And I did a lot of that. I, I really believe that shortening it at some point anyway because it was a little too long. It, it would have ended up being a little too long to go with everything else. And very good. Uh, thank you very much. You got it now. 
So can we go back to the staff rounder with this uh, ball here? So you can see there's uh, a major element here. This, this is a big, big part of it. I'm going to end up spending a lot of time uh, uh, hogging this material out here. This, this right here on the other side of it, it's going to end up being a lower major leaf per se or a flower. Uh, and so I'm going to spend a lot of time hogging this out. And so, sorry about that. Sam, you said it was okay. You got a question? Could you turn a lot of that further than send it out? Great question. Could could I turn a lot of this? Um, originally, Herman, thank you so much. Y'all give Herman a round of applause. All right, so from now on, Herman is Herman is shown. He's a good button holder, okay? He can do that. Um, and by the way, he was in our class yesterday, and uh, it's my understanding y'all know that he does the turning and Sandra does the embellishing. That may change because Herman was showing that he learned how to do power carving and dry brushing. And he, he didn't bring anything, but he should have what he did. He did a great job. So, Sandra, you may be out of business. Who knows? <laughs> and you should have come. You would have enjoyed it. All right, so the question was, uh, can you turn some of this? Well, you can turn some of it, but remember when you're turning, it's what you're going to create 360 degrees around the, uh, the object. At some point, at some point, and the piece that's going around right now, because it's, it, you'll see that it's sort of flat. If I kept turning on that one, I would have, the, the common part of the wood, I would have had to make it much more narrow, uh, skinnier than I would want to. And so I, I stopped turning on that one early on. This one here, I, I did do certainly a lot, you know, more spindle turning to get this flare and I may towards the end quite honestly this happens a lot after I really get a, a better feel for how this is going to develop on, on the inside I will gradually start I want a nice flowing curve a nice complementary arc that seems proportionally to fit what is up here so visually I'm looking for a nice balance uh, with the piece and you know I, that's where I, I'm trying to do I'm not saying I always get there but this has a lot of visual heaviness right now this right here has will have a, a lot of potential to have sort of a lower um, hanging piece uh, and just like the sample that's going around you'll see uh, and even some of these over here you'll see that I'll often do the the leaf or the petal where it's where it's split down at the end this right here is a great opportunity for me to do there's a lot of opportunity to do things here a lot of opportunity for me to do some of that there uh, there's not as much here but still this is where that crack is running through I will what I'll do here I will definitely you know I'll, I'll pull up different saws and my coping saw I, I didn't bring all the saw, saws I have, but I'll, I'll go ahead, when I'm doing the beginning part, I'm roughing out basic form. And so it's just, a, it's, I'm not trying to be pretty, I'm just trying to get the, the hogging out to get the basic form in place. Uh, this is where that crack is, so I would end up spending a lot of time where this crack is. And this is not the safest thing to hold. Uh, I don't. Please do not uh, one hand an uh, angle grinder like I'm doing or a die grinder. It's not very safe. I'm doing it because I've done it so much, but do not do what I'm doing, okay? Can you hold? No, I'm, I'm good. What I'm, because I need to move it around more quickly. But I am walking the loose my body here, okay?
question about can't you do more of this on the turning the answer is a lot of times no because there's different parts that I'm wanting to hog out that I can't that I on one side that I don't want to hog out on the other side so no I can't in some situations I can I can do some turning but that actually I forgot to mention and this is this is important to, to know that uh, one version, uh, a simpler version of sort of a flower and vase is, is this right here, where it really is, I'm not doing um, much sculpting, it's more turned rather than, yes sir? I see you've got a mallet over there, do you, do you, do you use carving? I do. Yeah, it, I'm just asking, cedar's not a really hard wood, wouldn't that be better? I'm just asking. Um, I mean, if you got a good sharp chisel and a good mallet, you can take some, you can peel it. You, you, you are right. Uh, and that's assuming I know how to correctly use it. <laughs> right. I, I, when I get to this phase and, and beyond with finishing, I'm, I'm, I try out different tools until I find something that works for me. And I, I do have, I have some smaller, they're not, but I have some good hand, this is a two cherry uh, carbon chisel and, and I do keep them sharp. I don't have any, I know there's bigger chisels, and I, but I do use some hand chiseling. I also have uh, a, a Arbortech uh, carver with different uh, chisels that I will use as well. But um, I typically don't start using some of these methods until I get further into the process. The grain direction would be real scary for that too. As you went in with the two, you're gonna split the grain. Yeah, could. Power tools. Yeah, um, so the answer is what do I use? I keep trying different things till I find something that works with that unique particular situation. So that's why when I, I brought all the stuff I brought, Sam is going, wow, why'd you bring all this stuff? He didn't really say that, but I know he's thinking it. But I brought all these heavy tubs with all this. I said, well, I use, when I do this, I use a lot of different tools and angle grinders and stuff. So uh, in some situations, I would, I would start to uh, maybe use, try some chisels. There are some, even with this Arbortech power carver, there, there's some bigger chisels that, that might help me. Uh, honestly, at this point, I still find doing power carving is faster. I'm really not concerned about it being real rough at this point because I don't spend time uh, sanding the surfaces until I know I have the, the shape and the, uh, the lines like I want them. And so until then, I've, I've got, it's really, really rough. And uh, let me look at the time here. I'm trying to 
to decide how to best gauge. All right. So. All right. I cut myself on something. I always, my wife, by the way, she feels like every time I'm working on something, I do have to make a sacrifice to the blood gods. <laughs> and so I cut myself on something just a second ago, but it's fine. It's not bad. Anyway. Um, I will spend a lot of time hogging this material out. Based on um, the amount of dust and stuff it's creating, I'm, I'm not going to do that much more. I'm going to switch to the other one that is, is uh, uh, finished. Uh, do you have a Band-Aid? This is going to, I'm going to get blood everywhere, which, uh, paper, yeah, yeah that, that'll work. That's all right. That's all right. I should have had some bad days in here anyway. All right. Oh, okay. Just a bad day. Good to stop it leaving here. I think I maybe on one of the chisel edges. Y'all are asking really good questions. Well, I'm putting this on. What other what other good questions do you have? Oh, okay. Uh, Clayton is asking on on this Arbortech tool, uh, basically, what kind of wheel is that? It actually is a saber tooth wheel. It's a two inch, I believe, two inch saber tooth wheel, and uh, I uh, I found that it, it fits really well. The two, what I'm calling a two inch wheel, fits really well, and you can get them in. Uh, coarse, medium, or rough, medium, and fine. And I typically use the medium and the fine. And uh, it just does a good job removing material. And that's what I have in this one inch uh, ball burr here as well. And I have, uh, I think I put them in here. I uh, put them in somewhere. Oh, yeah. Here's, uh, let me pass these around as some other examples of. Saber tooth. I think most of these are saber tooth. Now, some of these are, they may be cuts all. But uh, these are some other examples. So, Sandra, you notice there's four here, right? So, I get four back. All right. No, 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 no. I get four back. I'm handing out four, so I get four back. Sandra, Sandra make sure I get four back. I'll watch you. Okay, y'all don't want to mess with Sandra. She's going to make sure I get four back. <laughs> uh, tricky. All right, so uh, I am also going to take this off. And, uh, hey, Rory, I want to pass that around so you can get a first-hand look at sort of where things were starting to go. And, yeah, it's really messy. I've got dust flying. I've got stuff all over the place. And... Right now, I don't have my shop built, so my my wife's car is in the garage, and I I only am able to do that if I promised I cleaned <laughs> off her car every time. So I've got a big old blower, and I blow it off, and and so I, all is well in the household at Corey White's house. Before I had my shop, I throw shop at my wife's car, speeded up the building of the shop. Ah. <laughs> That's a dangerous proposition there. Uh, this, like I was saying, I didn't finish saying, but I am going to say now. If if you want a, if you want to try, uh, and I encourage you to do this. If, this basically is a somewhat embellished natural edge, but sort of a gentle flowing, still flowering vase or flowering vessel. It's still done with the same kind of concept. Uh, this is honey locust, which is, uh, do y'all have any honey locust trees around here? Thorns and all. Yeah, thorns and all. Yeah. Uh, anyway, this, this one does have, it did have some cracks in it, does have some, and I did some repair on it, and it, I haven't looked at it in some time, uh, and wood moves, so. But you can still do something in the same spirit of creating an organic kind of looking vessel that doesn't involve all the many many hours that goes into the rest of this and but you can still get a really I think a beautiful form so pass that around which then leads me to 
when you get after you spend a lot of time on the the red cedar piece that's going around you I'll end up getting I'll end up having developed and making decisions about all right I like how this one is flowing this way and so I'll keep carving away I keep carving away what's not this basically and uh, that that bottom the one that John you know John has in his hand there the one that's in that he's touching with his left hand there that has all kinds of wonderful potential sometimes I will take a, a big section like that and I'll I'll decide I'm going to take I'm going to turn that into two petals for example if there's a, a larger mass of wood I will take that as an opportunity to to uh, I'll draw it out with the pen pencil or whatever and I'll say I, I can sort of perceive one petal uh, flowing upward uh, and I, as I'm looking at it, I, I see it because I, I'm sort of weird and I see it. But I, I see maybe a, a higher pedal up there and then I see a lower pedal flowing downward, sort of dipping down. And that's, it just takes a while to see these things. Maybe I'm just weird. Well, I know I'm weird, but I, I see things in, in, in uh, stumps and stuff. Yes? I don't have like your eye, but I'm looking at it. It looks like it's going to end up being block sided. Like your petals are all going to be on one side, and this yeah. side you don't have very much. So it's actually end up looking uniform. All right, great, great question. Rory is bringing up. Uh, if if I if it was absolutely important that it be uniform then I would get all anxious about that. But it doesn't have to be uniform. Uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, uniformity in nature, there's a, but there's a lot of randomness too. And I've even done, it, it, I wanted to point out about this right here, um, maybe not this one, but maybe this one. I've done some, some flowering vases where I decided to make it uh, one that, that lays down. And... Uh, sort of uh, is the best, I had one that I did that I had some really nice curling flowing petals here and that allowed it to sort of prop itself up and lay down. And, and I was, actually you know who suggested that Sammy was Gary Sanders. Uh, I was asking, Gary Sanders is a very artistic uh, wood turner in Texas in what was my home club in, in uh, Greenville, Texas, Hunt County Wood Turners. And uh, he was, I was getting some ideas from him one time and he said, you know, why does it have to stand up? Why don't you make some that lay down? And I said, well, I had never thought about that. And that was a great suggestion. And as, yes, ma'am. Yeah, because like if you were to put it on a bookshelf as a woman, it would be like a little bubble book to put it in the book on the bookshelf and it would stand out. Yeah. But you got different things in your bookshelf and it would it. I, I, it was a great suggestion and yeah beauty's in the eye of the beholder and you're thinking well yeah why didn't you think of that Corey well I'm, I'm not the sharpest person but I, I try to ask a lot of people that are sharper than me and give me ideas Gary, Gary Sanders when he was here introduced the idea of no foot on a pole he did it you know it balance yeah well in that that is sort of I'm not saying I'm Gary Sanders at all. Gary is an incredible wood artist, and that's somewhat of an approach I took with that piece over there that is on the the black block from the orange tree trunk uh, stump. So, uh, all right. So here we are now. I am the way I'm gonna I'm gonna need to take a quick break, and I'm gonna set some other some finer working tools up. And I'll probably end up, yeah, I'll probably end up holding it instead of using this because I'm going to be working more uh, downward and I'm going to show you the things that I do as I'm trying to refine and finish up a piece like this. So can we take like a five minute break, seven minute break? All right, give me, and I'm going to set up some different tools here. Those were the same four I sent here. Uh, I am. Can we take the? Can we take?
type the tail stop. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, it's not quite, like, even just being able to get further out of spot. And if you don't take it off, that's another thing. Is that going to be good? Yeah, that'd be fine. You're not going to get your up on No, that's fine. And I'll just move this way down here. This is a hard You're really doing great. Uh, it's a hard thing to try to explain. Well, and uh, I, I really, I was not sure that making a big noise was in your I think you'd be surprised what they pick up on by just being able to see what you're doing there ahead of you, you know. I don't 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 know. Are you not concerned with seeing the fibers in your room? Me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I get, I get a question. Yes, sir. Uh, How'd you keep it? Uh, 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 yeah. Super blue? Uh, yeah. CA blue. Yeah. I yeah. need a lot of CA blue. I need a lot of CA blue. I need a lot of CA blue. I need a lot of the star bar is a flexible, like me, is Well, I I used the black and white, but in this particular piece, the amber was a better color. It is a better color. Yeah, but I would just wouldn't do this. Yeah, yeah. It's not what I did question. Uh, you know, you couldn't you know, these yeah. You know, I need to get some, uh, I need to sand back over there and see what that But anyway, I'll try it. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sorry, but it's just so much stuff. Bye.
Kevin, Duran, come on. We're getting started. Okay. So, uh, I had some questions that were asked to me. Uh, I already forgot them. But uh, as y'all were taking a break and looked at some of this stuff, y'all were talking. Did any other questions come up that you want me to answer before I talk about this next setup? Yes, sir. No dumb questions. It's all right. Pardon? Oh, yeah, great question. That's not a dumb question at all. Uh, on uh, this, this piece, and actually on both of these pieces here, uh, there, this piece, there were a lot of cracks that were going up in there, and I'm very open-minded with some of the flowering base pieces. I'm somewhat open-minded, pretty open-minded about using some wood that has cracks in it, because like I said, I see those as potential opportunities to create uh, line, visual lines in, in the organic piece that I end up doing. And so, uh, what's your name? Your name? Roland. Roland. Okay, so Roland was asking. He could see that I did some hardening to the tenons here. I just used uh, thin CA glue, just saturated it with thin CA glue and sprayed a activator on it because I just wanted to make sure that the <laughs> wanted to make sure that the tenon was as solid as possible. Uh, obviously, safety is very important. Great question, Roland. Thank you. Anything else that came up? What kind of finish 
Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, it, Jim's a uh, visitor here today. He's asking about what kind of finish. I've used a lot of different finishes. Some of those finishes uh, are more glossy. And that's, uh, if, if they're older, I probably use like a, a semi-gloss uh, polyurethane finish on it. And as I've evolved, I've found that I really like more of a natural sort of hand rub matte type of finish. And so now, my, right now, my go-to finish is pretty much a Watco Danish oil, just a clear Watco Danish oil. That's what I, I typically use now. Uh, I, I do want something that's going to bring out the color and you know some figure or you know some of the features in the the difference between sapwood, heartwood, heartwood. Uh, but I also want to have something that's going to give some protection to it and, and you know polymerize or harden in the fibers there. Great question. Anything else before I move on here? All right. So the whole while I was previously, I was doing big, making bigger mess, using bigger tools and rougher tools. Now, when I get to this point here, I, I transition to using finer tools. And so I am, I'm using, uh, I didn't mention this, but my dad is a retired jeweler. And I was very fortunate to get some of his hand-me-down, hand-me-ups, hand-me-down tools uh, this is one he had. I had uh, this. Oh, and I was trying to remember the brand of this, Sammy. It. Oh, this is Fordham. Okay, this is a Fordham Power Graver motor, which is sort of unique, um, but it's ended up being really, really good. It's not a regular Fordham. Uh, it's a Fordham Power Graver mo motor, and when I looked this up, it has more torque and runs at a lower speed because it was used, my dad would use it for power engraving on jewelry. And I end up using it, uh, it works perfectly for the sanding, a lot of the sanding that I do. You know, so it's running at a lower RPM and it has incredible torque and it doesn't bog down in any way. So that works really well. Um, so I'm, at this point, I'm doing a lot, of, lot more sanding rather than uh, grinding. But I still do uh, use my uh, Ram BP50, the uh, microcarver here, because um, I'm still, at this point, I'm working down in here a lot. And so I'll use, uh, sometimes I'll, there, as we know, there are, uh, in fact, those, in, good example, the, uh, here we go. I'm going to go ahead and switch out to this, switch this sanding instrument here. I'm going to switch it out. Y'all remember seeing this go by. It's a, it's a saber tooth yellow, so it's a fine uh, carbide. And what do you call this shape? Uh, flame. Flame? Okay, I, I forget. So this is a quarter inch shank flame. And uh, so I'm going to take this two inch sanding out of here because I end up spending quite a bit of time working down inside. Because when I've gotten to this point as I am here, I, I spend hours, and it, it's therapy, I don't even think about, you know, they say, hey Corey, how, how long did it take you to do that? And I, the answer is, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, the answer is, I don't care. The answer is it took as long as it took. Um, this, uh, this piece right here, it used to, I had a, a radial dial and I had a foot control, but now I actually, I, I just have it plugged in to a, to a separate power strip, and I just turn on the power strip, and turn, that's my fancy turning it on. Okay, so, which camera are you using right now? You're used. I can use every. Well, no, no, no. I'll, can you go to this one here? There we go. Okay, so I've got this flame burr here, and this is this is a really. You go, Gerald. You know what you're doing. You go whichever camera you want. I'm not in charge of you. But I'm going to use this 
deep down in here and this is solid enough that I, I don't have to go crazy in there. It, it is rattling around quite a bit. And it's, it's probably really hard to see what I'm doing. You'd have to try going to this camera. Is there oh. an extension that you could put on that dip that would make it go down? Father, I was thinking about that earlier. How do you get that deep with these tubes? Maybe. I, there may be an extension, but I, I'm just a real stubborn, persistent person. I've always been that way, and I say, Dad, I'm going to get down in there. And uh, I, I end up doing a lot of power carving down in there, but I also end up uh, getting, I'll, I'll fashion pieces of dowel or pieces of wood. I'll make my own custom sanding sticks that I, and so I spend hours just churning the butter, I guess, you know way down in here and what I'm trying to do here's what I've learned what I've realized over time is let me turn this off as, as my understanding as I've sort of evolved over time As I make these organic petal-like features, it I've, I've found that it's important, at least to me, uh, that there's a, okay, Let's stay right there a second. Okay, so here's, let me explain what I'm trying to do. Can you zoom in? If you can't, I'll move it. Oh, good. Okay, stay right there. All right, and I am going to keep it right here. This is like an IQ test I'm failing because it, you move it left and move right. Anyway, so um, what I my my thinking is, let's look at this this feature here, for example. I I end up building in sort of a, a ridge, a center ridge here, that flows downward and then on then as a result typically I'll have sort of a uh, would that be concave uh, concave uh, feature here because it visually even if you reckon you think about it or to me it makes sense if you're going to have a ridge up here running across uh, in a positive fashion here underneath there it should have a natural balance it should make sense it should complement each other the the top side and the bottom side and uh, so over time I I start at, I get to think a lot as I'm doing it because it goes slow and so as I start developing each of these and I, I'll just call them elements I start thinking about um, you know what it what it should look like what it should feel like and I think about this center ridge running downward <clears throat> and uh, power carving burrs like this help me go downward in there on either side of that center ridge to take that visual line downward it doesn't have to be perfect certainly by the time you get down there but to me it's very very important when when you look at this and you feel it that the the upper portion really does need to make sense to the eye and that way it it carries off this image of you know what the heck is that but it sort of looks organic it sort of looks flower like and that was just sort of what was in my head when I thought about you know if a, a, a turned wood turned vase and a bouquet of flowers got married this is what their kid would look like all right so that was just sort of the melding of those two kind of ideas. And so I use a lot of uh, power bars like this. Uh, the others that were passed around, uh, a whatever you call this, a round nose cylinder. Uh, this is very helpful working down in there. Uh, and I've got a, a fine 
saber-toothed ball burr that often is very, very helpful when I'm working outward here. And, uh, and once I end up finishing up a lot of the, the power carving, then I'm doing a lot of sanding, of course. And, and when I do that, I have ended up coming up with a lot of different sand. And by the way, I failed to mention this at the very beginning, and I'm going to say it here, probably will embarrass him. But uh, I, what the person that really lit the flame with me with power carving is this guy right over here, Sammy Long. He, he came and did a power carving class to Hunt County Woodturners, and I was just like, wow, I can do that. And, and it just, that, I don't know, maybe five years ago, four years ago. And, uh, and, it, and then, uh, so he, he got the flame lit, <clears throat> and he's a great wood artist. Yes, sir. Say you put a lot of work into one of those pedals, and you start to see a crack develop across that. Okay. Do you apply CA or a <clears throat> resin or some kind of get that? Um, well, typically I'm, you know, it, I don't want to work with wet green wood, so um, it doesn't happen a lot. But uh, that that piece closest to Sammy, that red cedar piece, that's really intricate. I can't tell you how many times I broke pieces while I was doing what I did on it. And I'm not going to sell that because it has too many broken parts. You may not be able to spot them, but if you look close enough, you can see where I <clears throat> broke them and fixed them. But um, <clears throat> if I see a crack starting, again, I any crack that starts, I, I look at it as an opportunity to, to put another wrinkle or another flare or maybe take what I was doing and divide that major pedal, I may say, you know, I'm going to divide that into two. And I'm going to, like when John was holding up the piece, I may say, you know, I think I could take one of them sort of twisting out this way and take another one this way. I, I, I use what it gives me and I, I don't fight it. I, I want to, I want to, it's a dance between here. Yes, sir. Do you uh, ever rough turn green wood and then let it, let it dry and then do this to it? Um, not typically. Maybe I should. I, yeah, it would be a lot easier to turn. Maybe. And then it'd be easy to get people dry with her. It seems like. It, um, it, it, it does make sense that, you know, you know the, I do a lot of first turning, rough turning of bowls and pieces for the purpose of being able to accelerate the drying process. Yeah, That's a great suggestion. I, I'm still, I think, it's sort of young emerging wood turner. I've only been doing this seven years, but, uh, and so I'm still learning and I'm still trying to develop best practices. That that probably is a real good suggestion. All your pieces have the pith in them, so that just invites some crack in anyway. Yes, uh, it does. And uh, we, we know the pith uh, is a very volatile part of the wood and it is trying to release tension as it's drying out um, and uh, so you know, I just do my best with that and I, I don't claim to be the smartest and but there are some things that I I love working around and talking wood turning because I keep learning and uh, so maybe I should do some uh, rough turning uh, with some green pieces and maybe I could avoid um, if I do it right, perhaps, maybe I could avoid some cracking or help it dry out faster. I don't, I'm not sure. It, it's a great, great question. Any, anything else right now? Yes, sir. What, what helps you decide, like, what helps the species of leaf to choose? Okay. Uh, fair, that's a fair question. Clayton's asking, um, you know, what kind of species am I trying to, to carve out or whatever. Um, I'll tell you, I'm not, what I'm not trying to do, you know what, uh, I was thinking a way that Jacques Vessery, uh, I was very fortunate to take a class with Jacques Vessery at uh, Aramont this past November, and um, he had done something, and uh, someone was criticizing how it was inaccurate. Uh, it was, it, but 
inaccurate from a biological standpoint of some seed form or whatever. And and he, he was saying, so this is just my take on it. This is my interpretation. And so I would just say, um, because last time I checked, I don't see these growing out there. And uh, But my take on it is, um, I, as far as any leaves are concerned, uh, I will say um, a lot of the lily family flowers have a lot of uh, similar type uh, broad leaves that come to more of a point perhaps. I, I'm not a uh, expert on flowers and leaves and stuff, but all I can say is this is, you know, this is my take of what's in my head and it seems to be something that looks nice. So. Gressory puts feathers on the seashell or yeah. scales. Right. It's, and that's, maybe that's why I was drawn to do more artistic kind of things because it gives me a wide range of freedom to do what I want and uh, I like that. I, in my previous career, my previous life, I had, uh, as a school teacher and school administrator, I had tight, very specified borders and I had to wear a coat and tie all the time and uh, and now I have maybe one suit and I've got a pickup truck and and I bathe whenever I want to <laughs> so yeah at least once a week so uh, and I get to be dirty and, and messy my wife doesn't like that but all right so um, I, I end up spending a lot of time sanding and I took this off in order to do something I'm trying to think what it was Oh, I think I was going to put this in there perhaps. I don't remember now. It, uh, I guess that comes with age and you start something, you forget why you were going to do it. I'm going to say I did it so I could put this finer uh, saber tooth ball in here. Just to show, let me turn this on. I need to have that so I can do it with my foot. Let me plug it in further down on this power strip. So, um, in the process of trying to develop the shape, the inside shape of these leaves or, or these forms, this one inch, in many times, the, in many cases, this one inch size really works well for the, basically you have a channel. So I think, I use the word channel because it, it really helps me, I'm going to have to hold this tighter so it doesn't rattle around. But it really helps me create that, that form with that center peak running down there. This, this is a lot of the, it helps me with the, the, still with the roughing process. And as I'm working downward. And when I do this, I'm, I turn that off with my foot. There we go. Actually worked that time. When I do this, I'm actually my mind starts wandering, and I start imagining um, what each one of I start thinking about movement, and I start imagining, you know, how this, how these different parts of it would would show that they're reaching for the sunlight, and, and I start thinking about, you know, some would be twisting, some some of the the leaves or petals will have opened up earlier. I start thinking about, um, and this is something that Sammy uh, taught me early on about when he's teaching the, I took the same class some of y'all have been in, the leaf carving, and he made me think about what's on top of what, you know, and you were talking about undercutting and what this part of this leaf is going to be on top of that part. And so as I'm going through this, I'm thinking about these different pieces and I'm thinking I'm thinking sort of flower like and when a flower blooms um, a daylily or whatever it there's there's a order and there's a stacking you know some are more inside some are outside and so I deliberately spend time thinking about all right this one here was coming out first and this one is sort of tucked inside this and it's a, a newer part of it and so I start building in this idea that uh, you have some, this is, this is an opening up of an organic flower or something that has a lot of beauty. 
And then I, I start thinking about things like, um, you know, this this one here. I start making up stories in my head. Maybe that's why I always the teacher would say, "Hey, Corey, Corey, you with us? Come on, come on." I was daydreaming about something, but I like this this little rollover part of the side of the the leaf here. I start thinking about, you know, this one, you know, had a had a lot of uh, width, but it, it was sort of cramped in here, and so it started rolling over a little bit. And so I, I don't know, it's, I'm just telling you what sort of goes through my head there. And so I sort of think about how, how it was growing out. Because I, I really, part of what I'm wanting the, the viewer experience to include is I want people to want to touch it, feel it, look at it, but I almost want it to feel when you look at some of these pieces, I want you to feel like there's a lot of fluid and almost maybe even some movement. I, I want it to come across as organic and, and just sort of free flowing and maybe you can just sort of visualize it, it moving with the wind or throughout the day adjusting to the sunlight. The, so bizarre, creative, sort of out there, I'm not sure, but I'm, Sammy said, yeah, go ahead and come and, and explain this. So hopefully that's uh, sort of some of what you're thinking. Now, sanding, I, uh, I, I, and I've called Sammy up many times and, and I'll say, Sammy, I'm having the hardest time getting in here and getting there and he has showed me different times, different special sanding things that he has made. And I wanna show you some of the things that where I, when I really get towards the end of the process, I'm trying to get in all nooks and crannies and I'm trying to sand it in places that they don't make tools to do that. So, uh, of course, one thing I, I use are these two inch sanding discs with cushions, and that gives me a lot of versatility. But what I also started to realize was that I could, here's a good example, uh, I could customize, you know, the, we see these all the time, but I needed something that would give me much more flexibility. And so I said to myself, I wonder, I wonder if I could take my uh, bench grinder and I could customize, I could customize this so that it would be more flexible. So I could really get into, and Sandra, you wanna pass that around? So I could get into tighter places and I could make it curve and flex. And so I started creating some things that you'll see in just a second that allowed me to get into real tight spaces and, and really curve around in there. And then I, 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 use, I use three inch, I, I use two inch, and I also started creating some one inch sanding uh, systems. They do make some, and you can find one inch uh, sanding discs too and that helps a lot as you're getting into these channels and trying to to uh, sand them the last resort is sanding by hand I, I, I do sand by hand a lot only in the situations that I can't get any kind of power sanding apparatus in there uh, and I that's my last resort and that's fine but then I've also let me show you this uh, who what Rory were you looking at this and you're saying what the heck is that all right this this is something that, you know, I don't know if it's an original idea or not. I think I, t I showed, I said, hey, Sammy, I came up with an idea. And I told him about it. He goes, yeah, yeah, already done it. <laughs> I don't know if he did it, but that's what he told me. Anyway, so uh, this, I, it, and it, again, it's not rocket science. Different people have come up with these ideas. But this is a punch. It's a, basically a quarter, quarter, quarter inch punch. You want to pass that around? And so I, I said, hey, that, that gives me an idea. These, I, I got that quarter inch punch at Hobby Lobby and I got these little foam, adhesive foam pieces where it's adhesive on both sides. And then I took a little mandrel here and I said, I bet you I can put this with that and punch a quarter inch sandy disc and then use that in my power car and go to town and learn you know it ended up working so 
Sandra, thank you. I'm glad you're here. Otherwise, Herman would be getting up and down, up and down. That'd be slow. <laughs> All right. So I ended up creating uh, the ability to do smaller and smaller sanding, which saves time because there's when it makes you really appreciate when you're sanding a bowl. After I work on one of these a bunch of hours, I'll then maybe turn a bowl or something. And I'm going, wow, now this is easy sanding now. But uh, I also found, uh, I've searched, scoured the internet for different sanding tools. Another one is, is this with the eighth, eighth inch uh, shank for me to be able to get into tight places. Uh, I've been able to find it in coarse and medium grind. Um, and then of course I, I have, who was it was asking about using hand chisels earlier? Uh, Brian, I think. Uh, I do end up in some situations where I, as I'm developing the final visual lines, I'm, I want to, what I think is very, very important is the transition between elements here. And for me, I, I think is incredibly important to have real crisp, well-defined transition points between these elements. And it is, it's hard to, to get that in different ways. And that's when I end up using different chisels uh, very, uh, uh, to get in different type spaces. I end up using my, my coping saw, I end up using a real uh, a fine tooth saw. I end up using the power carver. I just keep pulling as a I'll try a tool, does it work? And then I just keep finding tools until I can find something that gives me a real fine edge because I'm looking for making these uh, different V openings, V openings basically, um, and uh, till it ends up getting what it needs to be. And I end up using a, a lot of um, a lot of very fine uh, diamond uh, pointed power burrs to get down in here further. But so it, it ends up being a lot of sanding, a lot of sculpting, and I keep trying to make it the, the mass visually look and feel appropriately balanced. Um, and I keep just working with it until it seems to make sense to my brain there. Yes, sir. Right. Um, I see that I. There are some. Uh, I did forget to bring this. There are some uh, long. I, I have a three. Maybe it's a three inch, um, three quarter inch diameter sanding drum. Uh, sanding. Uh, aren't they called sanding drums or sanding drums? That it gives me some length. And, I, and then you have the, the sanding sleeves you can put over that. I forgot that. I do use that with, with my Fordham tool, and I get way down in there. But sometimes I just can't get down in there well enough. And I don't try to, I really concentrate on probably the upper part. Um, by the time it's down past the, the midpoint, I'm really just letting it, I don't really get overly anxious. Yeah, I mean, we know as wood turners, we look at every, we look deep, we put our fingers down, we, we look to see how it's finished on the bottom. We're very, we, we want to, we're curious minded people. Yeah, Roy. It's probably a really crazy idea, but had you thought about experimenting with leaving a textured surface versus a very smooth surface, something akin to what you were teaching us in Dallas? Maybe use some wire brush. I don't yeah. know. Uh, Rory is asking a, a good question. I have thought about this um, somewhat. In, in fact, the piece that I should have brought it, it's back at Sammy's house. The piece that Rory was talking about where I had the, the flower petals coming out of this smaller vase-like shape. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but it, was, it wasn't it was smooth. It was textured. 
Okay. So he's he's asking, Corey, have you given thought to maybe um, evolve in your process to build in texture and maybe some uh, dry brushing, basically is what you're leading to. And the answer is, uh, yes, I, I definitely have. Uh, there's That's the piece that Rory is talking about. Yeah, and you can see that it does have texture. And that that's a great question, and it does make me wonder, hmm, that, that probably is a good idea. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm a real just sort of go with my gut and go with the flow of how things are going. And, and I, like I say, I benefit from having conversations about what I'm doing because it helps me, it, it helps me ask myself more questions, what if questions. And I like what if questions. So um, that's a great one. And who knows, maybe next time you see a posting on Facebook or whatever, you may you may say, hey, that, that was my idea. Rory, yeah, I, I copyrighted that idea. You can't do that without my permission. Well, sorry. Anyway, uh, really good question. Um, so lots of sanding, and at the last resort, lots of hand sanding. And when I'm finishing up, I'm trying to make sure visually that I look at it from all different angles and I'm trying to make sure that it there's nothing that's visually distracting and I talked to the in the last two classes about what you're doing and when we when we do embellishing and whenever we do whatever we do with embellishing when when you have someone look at what you've done you want to make sure that there's not anything that is going to draw their eye to that you don't want them to look at. So if you have something that is something that makes them say, wow, what the heck is that? Or what happened there? Or that sort of looks weird. Whatever that is, you want to eliminate those things. And the same, I think, I believe the same thing is about form and the flow of the angles. Uh, it needs to look visually pleasing to the eye and you know I'll take stuff in and show my wife and say what do you think yeah you know or she'll say wow that's that's beautiful and so I, she, she always and I think uh, Maureen does the same thing with Sammy she's a tough critic but she'll tell him how it is and my wife you know I'm fortunate to have someone that doesn't sugarcoat it either and she'll say yeah, that looks weird right there or whatever. And I said, what? And she'll point something out that I didn't, wasn't really thinking about. I said, yeah, I guess you're right. I didn't think about that. So when you do what you do, when we do what, be sure you have some colleagues, some friends that you know will tell you the truth. And you'll, don't, how we learn, we ask, we need to ask and we need to share, you know, open shop and, 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 uh, uh, show and tell those are great opportunities for us to share what we're doing and for ask each other questions That's how we learn from each other. It, the wood turning community is and should be and, and can be an incredibly powerful learning community and uh, American Association of Wood Turners is is that the regional symposiums and and I'm biased But I think SWAT is one of the best regional symposiums around if you haven't been you need to be there I'll I'm going to be turning uh, my version of Christmas trees. So I like to do a lot of embellishing. And so you might imagine, I wonder what kind of Christmas tree Corey might turn. But it's a real fanciful, kind of highly embellished. So you, I do invite you to come and see that. Other questions uh, that you might have as we're finishing up here. No, no stupid questions. And, and there's always questions that people will come up and say, well, I didn't want to ask in front of everybody. I thought it was a stupid question. There, it's not a stupid question. There's really not once. But anyway, any other follow-up questions you have about any of the tools? Uh, I just keep trying to find a tool that will do what I want it to do. And I'm just real stubborn and persistent and uh, determined. And that's just how I've been all my life. 
you want to talk about finishes on, on top of that, like what you're using? Um, yeah, there was a question earlier about finish, and, and I my go-to finish now is wide coat Danish oil, the clear Danish oil. That's what I like right now. But uh, don't be surprised if you start to see uh, some of these future flowering vases that I do that may have some texture, may end up having some dry brushing, some color. Uh, right now I haven't necessarily been doing that, but um, I'm evolving. I'm, I'm continue to experimenting and ask what ifs, and so you may see some <coughs> color and texturing in the future. Yes, sir. Uh, do you use any uh, sand and sealer? Um, no, not with these, not typically. Um, might should, might not, I'm not sure. I don't know. All right, uh, yes, sir. What's dry brushing? Great question. You should have come to the class. <laughs> I wish I could. Yeah, uh, well maybe, maybe I'll get invited back uh, another time. I'd love to, got, man, I, I get room and board at Sammy's house and it, it, that. Not, oh, I'm, oh wow, one time thing. But, all right, great question. What the heck is dry brushing? I didn't bring any examples of that, but. Uh, uh, great, great example. Some of the ones that attended the class on Thursday or Friday. Uh, so what is dry brushing? Dry brushing is where camera. you... No, camera. camera. Okay, so dry brushing is where you end up... Where's the camera? There we go. I'll just keep it right here. Where you do some type of embellishing texture either through wood burning or through power carving and then you will take that texture and you will and I, I learned from Jacques Vessery and so uh, different people will say well why do you do it that way and I just my answer is well I wanted to learn how to do dry brushing and so I found the the best person that seems to do it and I went to a school I learned from them and so until I think I know any better I'm going to do how they do it or try to do it like that so that's the answer so uh, Jacques Vessery will then use India ink on top of the texturing that he <coughs> created and then Jacques Vessery will use uh, typically matte acrylic paint with a paintbrush in a very interesting step-by-step -step process where you and this is where the phrase dry brushing comes from you use just a tiny little bit of paint Herman. yeah I had to keep getting on to Herman yesterday you got to huh you, yeah yeah even before I eventually he wasn't the only one if Matt where's Matt yeah Matt you probably even before I, he would see me start walking towards him, he'd go, I know, I know, I have too much paint on my brush. Yeah, and you have to pat it out, pat it out, because you want that the pigment of the paint to go further up as it's sort of drying into the bristles of the brush. And so it, you're patting it down on a piece of paper, and it looks like, wow, there's not any paint in there. The answer is, there really is. And, and it, it took me a long time to realize that too, and Herman's still trying to get through that. He kept putting too much paint on it because you don't want it wet. You really don't want it wet. You want it so that as you start then very gradually, very lightly brushing, using the surface of the, the paint brush on there, you want to just brush it on top of the texture and it will start laying down the color pigment um, onto the higher elevation lines and peaks of whatever you've created and it creates beautiful depth and complexity of your texture. Do you know which Indian, Indian ink color and uh, what is the paint? It's just a it, it's acrylic? A, it, it's acrylic. I, I use, I use uh, for the most part matte acrylic paint. I also use some metallic uh, acrylic paints. Yeah. The blue on there, what, what combination? Uh, is this, is this matte? Who's, is this one yours? Are you, 
if it, if they like it, then it's yours. <laughs> okay. Now I think it. I think that blue may be cobalt blue. Um, I had. I'm. I'm bad about. Oh, I need to buy this color. I need to buy this color. I, I, I really don't remember. Uh, but it. You need that color uh, often where you're thinking. Oh, I wish I had a color that would complement this other color. So. What I loved and what he taught me is we started with the black ink it's speedball it's, it's, it's speedball brand super black india ink and you you see all the texturing in there so you get to the black all in those cracks then we come back with a second layer of acrylic and we're working that in but maybe not as heavy and then it's the dry brushing with just you can't believe how little paint you got on your brush i had to get on to rory too i said you got way too much paint on your brush and they were about to start to put it on their tape. I said, no, stop, stop. You're going to have blotch of paint all over that, and then you're going to be mad. All right? You should say color wheel should help, too. Right, yeah. So if, if you haven't had an opportunity to uh, learn about dry brushing, yes, I'm biased. I think it's, uh, you know, incredible. I think it's a great way to embellish pieces. Uh, the whole point of what we went through those two days was to set up skills for y'all to take a, 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 a saucer or a plate or a platter or a bowl with a, a and do something you know starting simple with some rim embellishing really I think we're probably going to get Roy to do a dry brushing demo here down the road. Uh, Rory is, is ready for that <laughs> okay uh, we got off this a little bit which is fine I any other questions? What was that India ink? What was the name of it? The brand was Speedball. Speedball, Speedball which is, they, they do a lot. I, I've done calligraphy in the past, and uh, Speedball is a, a brand that makes a lot of calligraphy uh, instruments. And Sandra, I think there are links to all that in the demo handout. Is it in the demo? Yes. I'll tell you where it's at. It's not in okay. the demo. That's an old brand. Of yeah, uh, the brand is Speedball, super black, <coughs> super black. And it's India ink. I know I use a lot of India ink. Okay. When I paint. Great. And they've got all these colors now. Right. And iridescent colors. Yes. And I hear you're quite the painter. So you and Herman need to talk about this dry brushing. All right. Uh, Y'all have been awesome, and I appreciate the questions. Any last questions? All right. This is. It's. I struggle trying to explain the process, especially where you can you can see how messy and dusty it gets. And I apologize for you know putting all that up in the air, but it I find great joy in doing these and making them. It takes how long does it take? As long as it takes. And uh, and uh, and if I just hope maybe it has sparked some ideas in your mind that maybe you think oh, that's pretty cool you know and maybe you see a limb or something you might think i might try some of that try it i mean even if it doesn't work it, that's how we learn we learn from our failures all right Corey, so, what is your website uh in the uh, white wood white house wood what is it no, it's not that. Uh, I, I should have brought some business cards. Uh, it's wherewoodisart.com. Wherewoodisart.com is my website. I, and I, I do sell stuff. I'm not promoting you to buy stuff. But, uh, I do sell pieces uh, by word of mouth, some on the website too. But anyway, thank you all very much. Let's give him a hand. Thank you, Paul. Um, at this time, everybody kind of turn around. We can do our uh, show.